Hello, everyone. I'm Maria Raquel Bossi, Senior Director of Education and International Initiatives at Film Independent. And in that capacity, I'm fortunate to lead, lead Global Media Makers, a cultural exchange program designed to foster relationships between American and international film professionals and artists. Uh, film Independent started Global Media Makers five years ago in partnership with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. The highlight of the program is a residency in Los Angeles for mid-career filmmakers from 14 countries, including Egypt. Our guest today, esteemed Egyptian filmmaker Amr Salama, was part of the first residency in 2016. And since then, we have been following closely uh, his career uh, as his acclaimed film, Sheikh Jackson, premiered in festivals worldwide and was Egypt's submission to the Oscars in 2018. And now we're so excited to celebrate his new series, Paranormal, which is based on Ahmed Khaled's Tawfiq Supernatural books. And it's the first Netflix original series now streaming worldwide. I, I must say first Netflix original series from Egypt. <laughs> Um, welcome, Amr. Um, where are you? So nice to see you. My pleasure. Always my pleasure. Congratulations on this beautiful, beautiful show, which I have been watching in bits and pieces because I'm a scaredy cat. So uh, I need to take it one night at Not a time. Not <laughs> but I can appreciate it. It's such a classic, classic show. So congratulations. Um, and I'm, I'm really, we are really thrilled that uh, Lorena Lee, a uh, television critic of the Los Angeles Times, who is a fan of the show, is moderating this conversation. Uh, welcome, Lorraine. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, take it away. Thank you. Hello, Amar. <laughs> We are far away from each other. I believe you're in you're in Egypt. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, so the time a little bit of a time difference. <laughs> yes, it's it's 9 p.m. in Cairo now. Okay, all right. That's my um, bit time. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> versus when you start shooting, actually. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so I just want to say first that I think I discovered paranormal a little late, but I have to say. It is so great in, in that it's funny, it's super smart, um, this kind of dark humor that universally translates. You know, often it's kind of hard to translate humor, and especially since this is based on a series of books from an Egyptian author, sometimes that doesn't translate, but it certainly does here. Um, so, I think I want to back up a little and just for anyone who hasn't really seen it, how would you describe the show to them? The show is, uh, is, is uh, before I speak about the show, I have to say that it's, it was one of my uh, dreams to, to direct this show since I was a kid. Uh, before I even wanted to be a filmmaker, I was a big fan of the, show, of the books, uh, the book series. Uh, I never thought I'll turn out to be a director and, and direct them. What, uh, what made me fall in love with the books is that it's, it has this new tone of this uh, horror slash dark comedy, which is, I think, is a patent to Dr. Ahmed Khayt Taufi uh, when he wrote the books uh, to have this very special tone uh, that is very authentic and very Egyptian at the same time. So the show is simply about um, Dr. Rifat Ismail, who's a, who's, a, who's a doctor and who's uh, was a cynical, uh, skeptical, uh, smart person who's introvert. He doesn't like people so much. He doesn't believe in anything that cannot be measured in a, in, in a laboratory. So this person is somehow cursed with everything that is supernatural, everything that is unexplainable by science. Uh, and uh, how he's facing all of that with this dark humor, uh, in a setting that was very special, which is 1960s Cairo, which is one of the uh, the eras that we always remember with a, with a lot of nostalgia. How Egypt used to be like uh, uh, a, a, like a magnificent place that is so cosmopolitan. It, it looked like 
uh, Paris back then they used to call it the Paris of the Middle East uh, so uh, the setting is is magnificent uh, the stories uh, Dr. Ahmed Khayta was uh, was very productive he wrote more than 80 books um, most of them have very very authentic original themes that were never explored not just in the Middle East but also in the world you know, I, I love that you brought up the 1960s, Egypt, Cairo, you capture that so well. Um, you know, my, my family's from Iraq, but my uncles, uh, there's people in there that I know, you know, and the way they're dressed and the glasses and the wide lapels, yes. it captures it so well. But what's also really unique about this is, as you just said, the author has these unique stories, but a lot of these things that um, are brought up here are based in kind of regional superstitions, regional myths. And so it's really interesting to kind of, as somebody who doesn't live there, to go into these all these different regions and like, what what was the superstition here or there? So you really brought that to life here. Exactly. Uh, the thing is, uh, the Arab world and uh, especially the Egyptian people uh, in comparison, they, you can say that they are more superstitious than people in Europe or in the States. And at the same time, when you look at the horror genre, how many uh, films and TV series in the horror genre in the, in the West, uh, there are so, so many. Uh, and when you compare that to the Arab world, it has very, very few uh, uh, films or TV series that were produced in that genre in, in, in a long history of filmmaking. Like Egypt started to make films right after France. Uh, that was uh, more than 100 years ago. And yet you can't count uh, horror films uh, on one hand uh, in, in this long history, history of, of making films. So there were some years where we produced more than 100 films a year. And in this long history of filmmaking, you can't find this genre being uh, produce that uh, much uh, and that was one of the challenges because when you do a genre that has very uh, complicated uh, uh, requirements and very complicated uh, technicalities uh, challenges uh, it was like we are uh, inventing the wheel uh, so that was one of the big challenges during this show can you speak in specifics about um, what that process was like, like trying to either, you know, you're adapting things from the book, um, just in terms of like the writer's room, what, what was that process like? So the process mainly started with this big question. How uh, much are we willing to surprise the fans? Uh, I remember when we spoke to Netflix at, at the beginning, we were like, we can't make the fans angry. And they were like, we're making, producing a show for the world. How many people read the books? I told them, no, like, believe me, they will be very angry if we, if we don't stay true to the original text. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't want to stay that too much uh, constrained by the original books, because that might, might, might not fit the medium uh, of, of television. We have to make people watch this episode and then what the other episode and have a story that is more serialized. Uh, although the books were totally like uh, separated from each other, like they were totally like an anthology. So how to knit all these stories into a one uh, thread, which was the one of the hardest choices. And that was the biggest choice we had in the writing room. And we discussed it a lot. And uh, the other choice was uh, if people knew the endings because they read the books, they will not be surprised anymore. So we always try to tease the audience that you're gonna use the ending of the book, but then maybe surprise them with, with, a, with, a, with another trick or so. Uh, and uh, I think one of the hardest things as well is that you are torn between two things. First, the world have seen so many horror so many horror, it's fine, it's fine, we'll do that. I don't know what that um. is. <laughs> I apologize, I don't know if that's coming from mine or not. It's fine. I'm sorry, I don't know what that was. I don't have a phone in here, no idea. 
<laughs> yeah, FaceTime. Nobody understands FaceTime. Uh, <laughs> so the thing is, uh, on one hand, we have to show uh, the world uh, the horror genre in a, in a, in a, uh, with which they are very familiar with. So the, the, if you are watching this in the States or Europe, you've already watched tons of horror shows and, 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 and films before. But at the same time, uh, on the other hand, we are showing this to an audience in Egypt uh, which uh, is not that familiar with the horror genre. So how to please both? Those who have a long history and long culture of horror shows and films, and those who are, you are like, as we used to say, we're taking their hand uh, and let them enter this genre for the first time. So we were torn between the two, two uh, uh, things, and we were trying to find the right balance. Um, showing the world that we have our authentic stories, but still taking it step by step for the Egyptian audience to enter this new genre and achieve this suspension of disbelief. Uh, because I think Egyptian audience is the most cynical uh, audience in the world, especially when it comes to anything that is a, away from uh, a love and love triangle or divorce, marriage kind of soap. Uh, uh, soapy dramas. So it was this balance that was the hardest in the writing. So did you um, did you feel like a since this is the first Netflix series produced out of Egypt and congratulations, that's amazing. Um, did you feel like a great responsibility in that way to represent? Because you know when you're the first one out of the gate, sometimes it's like I have to do so much here. I have to check so many boxes. How did that feel? Uh, I didn't take a day off in two two years now, so I think that uh, is the like the simplest answer. Of course, we were uh, burdened by a lot of pressures. First is the first being the first Egyptian Netflix show. Uh, you have to be a good representation of your country and your culture, and your film industry. Second, the fans, the expectations of the fans. Third, which is the hardest, was uh, the tribute to Dr. Ahmed Khayt Taufi. Like, uh, he was always there in the room. He was always there watching over us. Like, we were always feel like he, he's watching this and we were trying to make him proud more than anything. And that was one of the hardest things. He was my mentor, a friend, a father figure, uh, and... Uh, it was one of my biggest failures of my life that I didn't produce this show while he was still alive. So uh, I was trying my best and we were all trying our best to honor his memory with doing the best we, we can ever do. And um, the all of the cast in here, they're phenomenal. They're, they're particularly, and I'm sorry I don't recall his name, but the, the main actor who plays Refat, he's amazing. Um, and I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm thinking I must have seen them in a million things before, right? Because they're all really, really good. How did you pull this cast together? Uh, funny thing to, to those who didn't know, everybody in the internet, when I when we first announced that he's going to play with at Smile, uh, everyone in the country was almost cursing my mom's name. So because he's like, they have yeah, I mean, a very big expectation for, for this role and He's, he's used to be known just for comedy skits and comedy roles and doing online videos and this and that. He never played a serious role before. So everyone was like, what are you doing? And uh, and uh, I was making a big bet. And I told him, like, after the show was, was out, I told him, Ahmed, you really saved my life. You did it perfectly. Uh, you made now everyone criticize anything else, but not the acting. Everyone is like, the acting is superb. Maybe they would criticize this or that, but nobody's criticizing him anymore. And I told him, you saved my life because if 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 if, if you didn't do it properly, we would have I, I would have been killed by all the fans that were threatening me in in, in my inbox and uh, all my social <laughs> networks uh, uh, messages. Uh, so I was uh, I'm I'm very glad uh, I, I got the chance to work with him. He's he's a, he's an amazing talent. He's a singer. He's a musician. He's a comedian. He's a writer. He's a comic artist. Uh, he's all of one. He's I, I always call him the king of all trades. 
Yeah, and he, um, I have to say also, I wanted to ask about this. With that character, his internal dialogue is so much of this because he's saying one thing, but he's thinking totally the opposite. And that back and forth is where some of the best comedy gold comes from here. Are yeah. those passages from the book or did you like how much of that is pulled from the book and how much of that is, is, is you or is your, are your writers doing that? Actually, he always had this internal dialogue in the books, but we never used one of those lines in the books, almost like maybe one or two, uh, but, but they were all uh, being written by us in the writing room. Uh, and I remember when I was, there was something I learned from a project that I did before uh, that everything has to be personal for a filmmaker. When I, I, only, I only did one project that I didn't feel connected with and it failed miserably. So after that project, I said, no, I have to find something. I put something in the, in, in the material that will make it feel, that feel the, would make me feel the ownership. So of course it was uh, Rifat Ismail from the books, but also I tried to uh, add pieces of myself in it. So it was somehow, uh, like everybody who knows me well, when they watch the first episode, oh, that's you, that's what you always say, that's what you always, <laughs> those are your remarks. Like, I'm a big believer of Murphy's Law. Like, if all the Murphy's Law thing and Rifat's Laws, they were not in the books at all. They were all uh, created by the writer's room. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's because I was, you know, as I'm watching it too, and I also thought like, there's this wonderful Arab fatalism, because people always use that term, like Arab fatalism. I'm like, oh my gosh, this captures it in such a wonderful way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was the hardest part actually also is that we were thinking always with writing every line of how it will be translated to English. Like, because we know now that it might be watched by a bigger audience, so, it has to be translatable. The joke has to be translatable. The, because sometimes we send the text to, to, to Netflix execs and, and some of them are not Egyptians or Arabs at all, and they will have to get the quirky, uh, sarcastic tone. Uh, and, and it was one of the hardest things because if you're just writing for your uh, audience and just Arab audience, it would be much easier to write these lines. But if you're you're speaking to a much broader audience, you have to put in mind how every line will be translated later. So you to make sure that it will work. Yeah, and that's what I was saying earlier. It, that is so hard to do. And it really, really works here. Because I was watching it with people who aren't, you know, who don't know the culture and we were just cracking. I mean, it's really <laughs> done well. Um, so I was wondering what, like who, what other filmmakers or other maybe perhaps as TV shows sort of influenced you or what, what did you kind of admire and look to as a, as a sort of, you know, way to move forward? I think the, uh, the bigger the number of your influences makes your work look more original. So we tried our best to, uh, to watch everything we can put our hands on. Uh, from all the countries so and mainly films to be honest than shows like I, I, I believe in the writer's room it was always like that there was a day of writing and day of watching day of writing and day of watching and I, I of course revisit all my favorites like uh, I love Korean and Spanish horrors I love like European horrors uh, of course American horrors uh, so from The Exorcist uh, to the last show, the Apple show for M. Night Shyamalan, uh, The Servant. So we've watched like literally everything we can put our hands on, but we tried our best to watch all the good films. So I think if now after this journey, I can pinpoint the films that I were uh, influenced us the more, I think maybe as a Spanish film called The Orphanage, maybe, uh, 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 Guillermo del Toro uh, films as well, especially in directing style. I was so uh, influenced by Guillermo del Toro, uh, especially his early films, uh, Pan's Liberneth and, and uh, other films and, uh, and uh, Korean films, uh, Tale of Two Sisters, uh, for example. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan was a big reference as well. He was, M. Night Shyamalan was a big influence, especially M. Night Shyamalan is a very generous 
commentators, like all the DVDs, he has all this commentary by him, like describing and explaining everything he does. So uh, yeah, we, we there were a lot of influences, but we were always trying to remind, our, remind ourselves it has to look Egyptian and authentic. We can't just mimic an international or, uh, or a certain style as it is. Uh, like the Japanese horror is amazing, but I don't think it can work at all as is in the Egyptian culture or or the Swedish. Like there was a, a Swedish film I remember that Dr. Ahmed Khaytafi himself sent it to me, uh, Let the Right One In, it's called. And he was like, this is as if it was written by me. This is so my tone. So that's why it was the first film we watched when we were studying the Red Room. Yeah, and I think, you know, like you're saying about all these, uh, the horror genre changing from different parts of the world, it's, you know, unique to that area. Like you're saying, I can't think of anything that's come from kind of our part of the world, which was why this was so exciting as well. But for it to hit in the US at this point is really good too, because you know, as you probably know, we've had, it's, the horror genre here has been mainly out of about white America, right? And so now we've had like a lot of get out um, and different like black films and black series. So I was excited when I saw this, I thought the timing's really good on this too. You know, people are hungry for different stories. Um, sorry, if you wanted to comment on that, but. No, actually, actually it's, it's inspiring. When I, when I watched Get Out and, uh and us and uh, and hereditary uh, for example uh, there, there's and and the witch there's when you think that the genre finally reached a dead end like there is nothing more to do in the genre and you find artists uh, uh, like taking it extra mile more this is this is very inspiring and uh, I hope we achieved that because uh, uh, I, I, one, of, one of the most flattering uh, comments I've read online, uh, I don't know from which country, uh, it was on Twitter, for someone saying, I don't, I love the show, I don't know what kind of language that that is, like they literally don't know if this is Arabic or Igbo or like Indian or whatever, uh, they were just like, we love the show, we don't know where is it from, and we love it, so... That maybe because we were just wrote Cairo, it didn't like Egypt, so a lot of people don't know where Cairo is. But the thing is, uh, uh, that was flattering for people for for people to watch the show wherever they are without putting in mind where is it from, and that made us feel that we did something universal, and that was the biggest goal we we had from the start. So, if you um, well, let me ask you this first. So. The Global Media Makers Program, can you just talk a little bit about like what that it like the, the mentorship in that and like what what that involves? I, I think it was one of the most eye opening experiences in my life because simply I went to Global Media Makers and uh, before that I made four films. So I went to Global Media Makers after I made four feature films and one uh, hit successful TV show. So I thought, like, what, I'm, what is there to learn? So I just go to LA and just enjoy my time and the weather and go do some shopping and, and just try to attend some lectures uh, to make them feel like I'm there. But when I went there, uh, it was like a reality check. Uh, it made me feel, uh, it, it crushed my ego and made me feel, go back to the learning position and made me feel young again because I started feeling like there is much more to learn and there are new uh, horizons horizons that can be explored uh, so I had uh, great mentors uh, and uh, they, they were in, they don't know what kind of films I made or like they don't care what kind of films I make they are teaching us all and mentoring us and I remember I went back from, from this trip thinking like, I wish I can go back in time and direct all the four films I did before again. And uh, uh, so it was, it was eye opening and especially all this conversation I had with them, uh, wiping them with coffee and whatever I can wipe them with, like, please, I want to have like a private conversation after the day ends or after the, the program ends, I want to take you for a coffee or a dinner and just discuss something with you. And I was so eager to learn more than even what was taught in, 
uh, in the class. So uh, it was eye opening. And I would really, really like to thank especially two people, Jeremy Pudusua and Alan Poole. They were very generous. They gave me a lot of their times. And when, even after I left LA and whenever I go back, they meet me or whenever I call them or email them, uh, they follow up, uh, which is amazing. They give me a lot of insights and, uh, and, and that was really generous. Like I always wonder uh, why in Egypt we don't have the same kind of apprenticeship or mentorship uh, and we don't have this kind of generosity with knowledge. Uh, and that's why actually I tried to pay it forward and I made tons of videos that I put online with everything I learned in Arabic because there were no Arabic resources online that can teach filmmaking for free. That's what I was going to ask you next. Like what, you know, what are you telling Egyptian filmmakers or just, you know, from the region or people that want to do series? I'm sure now you've got a lot of people saying like, how do I even, you know, what do I do? Like, how, how are you paying that forward or how are you getting out there with them? Yeah, after I came back, I made this workshop. I, I, uh, I partnered with a couple of uh, young talents to shoot it all. I, I gathered people like around uh, 18, uh, 18 aspiring filmmakers. We went to like a retreat. I spent three days trying to tell them everything I know about filmmaking in those three days. We shot it all. It, it created tons of material content that we put online for free for, for anyone to watch on on, on, on YouTube. And uh, after every like couple, couple of years, two or three years, I make one of those workshops and uh, try to uh, videotape them and, and, and put them online for free for people to even, uh, because like literally we don't have this Arabic uh, content platforms that can teach you filmmaking. And that's how I learned filmmaking myself. But to learn it, I had to study English. So because I didn't study English in school, so I had to teach myself English in order to teach myself filmmaking because wow. I, I didn't go to school. So that, uh, that's not a lot of wow. Yeah, not a lot of people speak English in Egypt. So that's why I wanted to provide them or, or to provide and put it out there and share my knowledge in Arabic so it can be accessible to everyone. Wow. Um, and um, what are you, are you working on something else now? Yeah, I overbooked <laughs> myself <laughs> and I regret it so much. Uh, I'm already sh shooting a feature now. Uh, I'm halfway through it. Uh, and the uh, thing is the pandemic, um, like I, I thought I had a very specific schedule and, and uh, a good uh, time and plan for my time in the next two years. But when the pandemic came, came, it changed everything. So now all the projects I signed, they want to shoot at the same time. So I'm trying to finish this to go shoot that. And uh, it's very exhausting, but at the same time, it's a good problem to have. I can't complain. Uh, before the last couple of gigs I made, uh, I used to sit with my script for three years to find a producer. Now, gladfully for, for the last couple of projects, uh, success now it's the opposite way around i'm trying like to find time to do all the projects i signed which is which is i'm, I'm very grateful i got the chance to tell all my stories that's a good position to be in um yeah. i just have one more question about paranormal then i'm going to take some questions um i'm just interested of where you shot it like because there's, there's so many different locations and the desert stuff was beautiful it, it's amazing and all the stuff near the marsh and the river Yes. Were you all over Egypt or where were you? That's an interesting part because when we started like signing with Netflix, we thought we will have all the money in the world to travel all around the world to shoot everything, whatever we want. And then when we hit reality and understand that the budget is not open, it, it's, it, it, it has a ceiling. So it, it was about like to find to try to eliminate every trip we can so we can shoot everything in Cairo as much as possible. And uh, what's the most interesting, uh, the most interesting thing about Cairo, uh, I always say this, it's the city of all the cultures. Every culture in the history of mankind left a stamp 
on Cairo, like the Romans, the Greeks, the Italians, the French, the British, uh, uh, the Arabs, uh, you name it, the, Tur the Turks, everyone. So Cairo is very diverse. It's one of the biggest cities in the world. It's one of, it, it has places in this show, it made me rediscover Egypt and Cairo. So uh, ironically, all the scenes in the show were shot in Cairo and the outskirts of Cairo. Although it looks like we went there and here and like the rules and like the desert and Libya and whatever, but all of this was shot in Cairo. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to read you a couple questions here. Um, the first one is, did you feel you had to make any compromises to make the show rise from the local regional audience to a more global scope? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say compromises. It, would, it was a big challenge uh, to always thinking with two brains. The brain of like, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a show for the Egyptian audience first and foremost, and then I'm also trying to present it to the whole world. So that was not a compromise, but more of a challenge, how to deliver uh, every emotion and every line and every th thought uh, in a way that is trans translatable and universal. So it's like putting, uh, like, it's like do doing double the work. It's like not just speaking your mind, but speaking in your mind in a language that everyone can understand, which is uh, one of the hardest things. Of course, I did that in my films because I always aim to reach a global audience or go to festivals. But in this show, especially, the pressure was was humongous. Uh, okay. Another question is: Can you speak about your collaboration with Netflix? How and when did they come on board? So that's the thing. I I pitched the show to Netflix like four times. Uh, and each every time it was to a different person and uh, I was uh, literally uh, asking my manager in the States to stalk them until I get a meeting with this person or this person and back then they didn't want to uh, it was not in their plan to produce in the Middle East so they were always like this is interesting uh, we'll give you a call so but I didn't lose hope so uh, I went there, uh, I think, to LA a couple of times. Uh, I pitched the show, and uh, in one of those meetings, finally, I was pitching the show, uh, and the lady told me, like, I'm not buying the show, I'm buying your passion. And uh, that's uh, one of the biggest lessons uh, I learned in life. Sometimes people really buy your belief and passion and enthusiasm uh, regardless of what you're saying, of course, it, not regardless, of course, it's a factor, but sometimes it's about you, how you perform, and you can't perform well if you don't believe in it yourself. Like, sometimes I have an idea and I go do my my circus show and go above the table to try to sell the show, but if you really don't believe it from the, believe in it and from, from inside of you and your heart and you really, like, want to do it, they can smell it. So you're really trying to, uh, especially if they don't know you, of course, if I'm, if I'm like Spielberg, they would have bought it from the first meeting. But if you're new, if you're struggling, if they don't know nothing about you, uh, you're trying to not just uh, 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 pitch your idea or explain the beats of the story or tell about your character. You have to show how much... Uh, uh, belief you have in, in your story. Um, what three things do you enjoy most and least about being a filmmaker? And not the least in the least part, you can't say doing interviews like this. Okay, that's <laughs> that's the only rule I have. <laughs> so the the thing I love the most is that one day in the middle of the night. I'm in my bathroom, I'm feeling sick and tired, and I get this new idea. And then after five years, I'm in the theater and watching it with thousands of people. So it has, it's, it's flattering to know that you have the power and the imagination and the tools to have a certain idea that you want to present to the world. And then after 
a certain amount of effort and time uh, and emotional investment, you really can present it to uh, a big number of people. And it's a way to express yourself and communicate with others and exchange ideas and learn something. That's one of the best things. And the other best thing is that uh, uh, filmmaking is is the best. Every project I made is, is 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 an amazing school. It taught me something about the world and about myself. So every project I made in my life made me research about something that I never cared about before. Made me knew certain people that I would have never known in my life. Made me go through experiences had to collaborate with different people. So after every show, I'm a li literally, I'm a different person, totally different person. Change, changes you psychologically and mentally and physically and emotionally. So it, 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 after every show or every project, you, you have this kind of amazing rebirth. Third thing about, third thing is, is of course the money. <laughs> to be honest, is if you if you do good job, good work, you get paid better. So, of course, the the money and fame and all of this is is a, is a plus. Uh, but you will never enjoy them if you're not being sincere to what you really want to tell and what you like. I, I told you I made a project that totally failed, and uh, I took a good amount of money, uh, better than many other shows. Uh, but I. Uh, I felt cheap, to be honest, because I didn't believe in the project that much. The worst thing is about filmmaking. They are a lot, uh, <laughs> much, a lot, more lot than than the best things. But uh, the, the worst thing is that uh, literally it ruins your lifestyle and your social life. Uh, it, it, it deprives you from having a routine that your body can understand. Uh, uh, the, if you're obsessed like me, you don't have a, a time off. You can be in a vacation in Hawaii and thinking about that scene that you want to rewrite. And uh, I think uh, one of the worst things about filmmaking is the emotional uh, train wreck uh, when your message is not delivered. When you're sitting in a theater and you want people to laugh in this beat and they they don't care and, and and you want them to cry here but they start laughing so when when you feel your failure is magnified when you feel in your office working as a day job maybe your boss will give you a couple of words but when you feel at the movie screen it's a disgrace like it will haunt you forever it can never be erased it will like after 20 years you will still see this film on television and and feel the regret so your failures are written uh, on a stone. So uh, that's why you have to be very cautious all the time. Hmm. This next question, I'm going to kind of add some of my own thing into it. Um, this person was asking about self-censorship, like how much do you kind of pull back? And they're asking because of Muslim teachings, but I'm going to ask you because of Egypt and the Middle East and all, it's so complicated. You know, it's like Coptic Muslim, it's everything, right? And everybody gets offended. Everybody gets pissed off. Um, so how, how hard is that line to walk? And then they're also asking how much of your work is censored by the government? So uh, to be honest, uh, the, the big difference I, I sensed between writing here in, in a place like the States, for example. So when I'm writing in the States, you don't wanna, uh, you wanna be like, of course now it's more than 10 years ago, you have all this political correctness thing that you have to be uh, very considerate to all the minorities and everyone. In Egypt, it's much harder because uh, I always say that I'm writing with seven imaginary people in the room. So I have the government censorship. I have the religious censorship. I have the family value censorship. I have my mom who will be very angry if, if, if I piss her off on screen. Uh, I have uh, the producer. I have the actors who wanna like uh, uh, brand themselves in certain ways. Uh, and 
I have my own censorship. So I struggled with all of these censorships. I, 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 uh, I had a film that was banned for more than four years before. Uh, I had to find every legal and public battle to get it out. Uh, I had a lawsuit against me by the general attorney of Egypt uh, for a scene I made in one of my films. I had to be interrogated for hours uh, about it uh, by the DA. Uh, and uh, I had my mom like telling me how you do this scene. I had all these censorships. But, and, and I had a self-censorship as well because when I started this career, I was very, very conservative person, totally the opposite of who I am now. And I always trying to find the balance between my beliefs back then and what I'm trying to say. And of course, through the course of my career, 15 years later, after all the learnings and after all the readings and after all the self uh, epiphanies I had, I changed into someone totally different. So now maybe I see my earlier films and think they were so censored by myself so censored by myself. Now I'm trying with every film I make to uh, not just to provoke people, but just to explore something that were never exposed before. And that of course gets some people angry. Yeah. And again, I, and I've said this before in this conversation, but it's a really hard line to walk. It's a hard line to be able to bring something new into the world while walking that line. That's, you know, I, that's why I was so, pleasantly surprised by this series. Um, I, I actually don't think it's a line, Lorraine. I think it's like walking a landmine. Uh, it's like, because you don't know where, when and where you're gonna push the button. You don't know what are you stepping on. Sometimes you would never think that this can angry some, someone. Like one of my films, Sheik Jackson, the one that was officially submitted uh, by my country to the Oscars, it's the same film that made me get interrogated by the, the general attorney, for example. Wow. And it's the same thing after it was released, four years four years after it's released, that was a couple of months ago, uh, I found out that my name and the film's name were trending on Twitter in France, number one trending, and for all this big campaign to boycott Netflix in France by the uh, Muslims in France because of a scene in the film. So I found myself on the news all of a sudden, just a couple of weeks before my show is out, uh, because some group of people thought the film is offensive, yeah. which is, as I say, it's walking on landmine, of course. Yeah, you don't know what you're going to trigger. That's, yeah. Um, I'm going to say this. This is not a question. This person just said this because of what you just talked about. This is not a question, but everyone here in Egypt is proud of you. You made something unique and we love it. So I'm just going to say that after <laughs> you talked about how difficult this was. Believe me, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's presenting your country. And uh, uh, I can say no matter how liberal or how universal I want to be, I'm still, I think, uh, I, I love this country and I believe in its history and I believe in its efforts and I believe in its long history of, of, of art and filmmaking. And I really wanted this film to just be a window uh, that can make the people look inside because we have all these hidden gems of films and shows and talents that are not exposed to the uh, rest of the world. And I wish, I wish that this show would help uh, 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 raise awareness or shed a light on the Egyptian industry and its talents and its literature as well. Uh, so uh, I always feel that I'm very proud uh, when, when, when I hear this from Egyptians. Someone's asking, um, what kind of critiques did you get back from your audience and other filmmakers about this series? Um, and I'm, I'm adding this part um, that kind of sunk in like, okay, yeah, that's something I'll think about next time or, you know, or something I would have done differently. Of course, the biggest critiques uh, were all like focused on two things, the wigs and the visual effects. And believe me, before the show was out, I was myself uh, wishing uh, we would have treated them differently. So 
although I had amazing team working on visual effects or the, uh, the, the, the makeup and hair department, but I know uh, we were not that lucky uh, with with some things. Uh, so although the f the show had humongous amount of visual effects shots that nobody notices, or it has a lot of makeup work that nobody notices, but still, when you have one thing that is not that perfect, uh, people uh, just pinpoint it. And I, right now, I'm just walking in the street every day, and people tell me we didn't like the gorilla every day in the street people tell me that so uh <laughs> so uh people yeah that's the biggest two critiques i had and from very specialized audience i got other kind of critiques that i thought were interesting maybe about the characters about the development of the characters maybe would have gave more time to other characters that because it was so focused on just refat ismail so all of these are interesting remarks that i always think about and of course if we write season two or even if i'm writing a different project i will keep them in mind okay i'm gonna I, i'm a critic so i'm gonna argue back on this as far as the wigs go what i really loved about this is that like we talked earlier in all different kinds of horror genres from different places like if you look at the old hammer horror films from england that would have been something that was in the Hammer Horror films, right? Yes. So I, I don't know, there are pieces in this series that would pull in, and I, I really like that. I thought, okay, this pulls in that kind of like retro horror, Hammer Horror film. I'm glad you got that. It was not intentional, but I hope all the audience would... I, I actually might use what you said just now uh, to tell the people later. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, and as for special effects, I have to say, I mean, maybe I'm in minority here, but growing up in America, everything was special effects and no story. And you can only have so much of that when you feel like you've eaten way too much candy and you're like, I need some substance. So I didn't really care. So, I mean, I thought it was kind of, again, part of the charm of it, but. I, th I think that was totally what we intended to do is that we just focus on the characters and the stories. And if we, make you push that button of suspension suspension of disbelief you might forgive everything you're watching but because this show had a hype in the region that is unprecedented so people were all watching with their knives like show me the first egyptian netflix production like we're gonna rip it apart if we see this tiny bit of a mistake so that was people were very on their edge trying to like pinpoint uh, the mistakes or the critiques and uh, so I, I, I expected that that people would be very harsh and actually with all of this I think uh, I'm very lucky that it was not as harsh as I thought even with those two minor critiques the majority of the feedback was magnificent yeah and that's you know and that's that hard part of being the first right because everybody yeah. wants it's like carrying so much weight. You, you, you know, we want, we all want to see that one piece that we're looking for, um, which is impossible, right? So why we, we, we didn't get that much of a critique from the international critics, like most of the international critics or bloggers or uh, people making like online videos about the show, they were not that harsh as the Egyptian audience when it comes to the mistakes. Um, and a question here is how long was the process from the idea until the final cut? 15 years. Wow. Yeah, we, we, we bought the, the rights 2016. So that's 14 years, 14 wow. years. The first draft was written in 2006, 2006, I'm sorry, 2006. The first draft was written in 2006. We started shopping it around for years and years and years. And we got many offers and we got so close to shooting and then they got like uh, dropped out. And then, so it was a very long journey. I would go to another project, do a film or a show and then come back trying to sell it again for, for the last 14 years. Um, and someone here is asking about um, this being like a, a period piece kind of a period, you know, so you're here you are in the sixties and how it looks pretty amazing. How did you, what was the process of recreating that? How, like, who did you have? I don't know. How did you do that so well? I think it was a lot of preparation because Egypt is a very flux city. Like you can go in a street 
and you visit that same street two days later and it's a totally different street. So bringing back Cairo to the 60s, which was very, very hard. I think I have to praise, I give a lot of praise to the production designer and the visual effects team and the costume designer uh, because it was a very hard job. Sometimes you have literally to shoot the same scene in, in three or four different locations, the same scene, because this angle can work here, but this angle has to work in, a, in another place and this angle has to work in a different place. So sometimes you have to really knit every shot with another shot just to make it look like it's in the 60s. Because sometimes you find that perfect balcony, but the window is not retro anymore. So you have to do a lot of CGI, a lot of like mix and match and cutting and tricks in the edit uh, to give that feel and look. And uh, the production designer and the production team, they literally were scanning all the streets of Cairo just to find sometimes a shop or an alley or a street or like a one angle or like a balcony. Literally, they were doing an amazing work just to achieve that. Um, and this is the last question because we're going to run out of time. But um, what advice would you have for um, filmmakers coming up, Egyptian and otherwise? But I guess let's focus on Egyptian. I, I think it doesn't have to do with Egyptians. It, it, it's something that's also very universal. Watch, read, and experiment. I think you have to watch a lot, not just films. You have to watch films from all the different countries and all the different cultures, and you have to watch plays, and you have to go watch shows, and you have to watch musicals, and you have to watch, go f to museums, and you have to read a lot about filmmaking and also about other domains. Like every other domain you visit makes you a different filmmaker, uh, like genetics, uh, philosophy, uh, uh, fixing cars, uh, uh, designing shoes. Like me, myself, I have to like literally every year I have to explore a new domain just to make myself believe I'm still learning. So last year I studied shoe design. The year before that, uh, I studied uh, music for the first time. I never played music. So it, every year I have to like learn something new about filmmaking and about other domains because it really broadens your scope. The third thing is experiment. If you have an iPad, you can be a filmmaker right now. Like you have a camera, you can edit on your iPad. So no excuses. You have to like if you want to like if you want to be a filmmaker right now, you just get your iPad, get two of your friends, and make a scene and shoot that and edit that and post it online. If it's good, someone's gonna chase you. So it's and and you will learn a lot from every uh, project you make and put it out there to the world. You will learn something. So I think it's just. Watch, read, and experiment. Thank you. I'm so glad we were able to make this happen and we were able to talk. I love the series. And thank you so much for doing this and everybody for watching. Thank you, Lorraine, so much. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.